Robson and David from Trivial Solutions AO here. And today I'll talk about, uh, I don't think it's <laughs> like essential topic, you can get by without it and it's more like, you know, niche, like very rare cases that you might need this for, but now let's talk about key value stores. And actually the only key value store that I like because I think <laughs> I think most of key value stores out there are a complete garbage and a waste of time, right? And you know, I by default, rule of a thumb, if you need a database, go for Postgres. You need high availability, you know, set it up with Patron, you have high availability, right? But you know, I had uh, some time like uh, where I need to, to research at a bigger scale, right? When, you know, simple database doesn't cut it at that point no longer and I tested various key value stores hammered them hard and I found the one that I really liked and I think it's getting more popular and uh, yeah, spoiler alert it's a foundation DB and I'll talk about like why so but first of all I will speak why you should probably not use a key value store <laughs> So my beef with most key value stores is that most people who think that they need one actually don't need one. And you know, like a lot of startups are like brand new project, like say, like this is example, I'm not naming the project or company, but you know, it was like a payment system for a small country, right? And uh, you know, there's no way in hell you could exhaust the transactions of a single Postgres instance in that case. And you can have an aisle available or something. And people in that, this is like when it was the microservices boom, everyone was going crazy. Oh, no, small services like the complete lower engineered project, failed project. And that project, I don't know, I don't remember who decided it, but uh, that was a very, very horrible decision. People decided to use ETCD to store customer data for that project, for a key value store. I cannot believe that to this day, you know, the ETCD service that was originally intended like, uh, you know, ETCD slash ETC a directory in your Linux machine where all the configs are kept, like config metadata. So ETCD does like forums, votes, you know, small key value store for things like that. People decided to use, I cannot believe this, people decided to use ETCD for storing customer data of all that country, right? And the project was a disaster, it failed, and that, it's not the only reason it failed, it was our engineer, it's, it's garbage, it was trivial, right? It could have been easily been implemented with the right tools, but, you know, that shows that a lot of people who think that they need a key value store actually don't need them and they're just wasting their time and they shoot themselves in the foot like right out the gate you're going a startup you're trying to implement your idea and you already have this huge boulder on your foot and and you already have like instant legacy code and you can't move you can't even get to the original idea when you have customers right when you might need a key value store i'd say you know a rule of thumb you know, I'm just spitballing, but you need to look into each case separately. If your database does thousand write transactions, write, write transactions, not reads, write transactions per second, then you might need to a key value store, right? Then you might actually need to do like separate strategy with your database. But you know, you can shard out the databases first. Like I mentioned, the uh, not Postgres, there are a lot of ways you can do with sharding, you know? But if you know, you decide to go with a key value store, at least have some traffic, right? Do not just start with a key value store and you have no users and your workflow is already super complex. And another point, my complete beef is most key value stores do not have begin and commit. You know, for those who don't know, be, uh, like begin and commit, like it's database transaction, you can modify multiple tables at once and commit and either all succeed, all of your changes or all fail and it's then consistent data. What do you have of a key value store? You don't have transactions. There are times like the, there are Bitcoin exchanges that lost 
uh, millions of dollars because they went to a key value store and it was inconsistent at some point and the attacker exploited like race condition or something like that. And people lost bazillion of money <laughs> just because people chose key value store when they shouldn't have to. Right? And it's just, you know, I don't understand why people pick this at the start. And usually most of these products that come out most of them have a poor quality. Like frankly, they're way poor where they, they don't even perform that well to begin with. Like from the things that I tested, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of times where just, you no know, Postgres instance performs better than the key value store that's supposed to be horizontally sharded, right? It's absolutely insane, right? And, you know, but you know, a lot of these, like it's marketing ploy and then you adopt it and then of course you'll need to purchase support for the key value store that's been around like for a few years and is already full of bugs and is utter trash, right? So, you know, and uh, another thing is they usually, since they're horizontally sharded, they might, the setup will rise, but they might need to have complex setup and they're complex to run, complex to maintain, and you don't have consistency guarantee. You have all these problems. And my main point is that most of the people who opt into these problems, they don't even need a key value store as they're in small scale, but they're like from the first day, we're gonna have billions of users. Like, dude, you don't even have thousand users at this point, what you're talking about. Right? Get to get to the ground level, you know? And yeah, so, and most of the, what key value stores quote unquote provide, like, well, horizontal scalability that you could do that with CETAs, but as I mentioned in Why Not Postgres video, most of these you can just get with a Postgres, right? And just live happily ever after. So now that I've ranted about why most key value stores are an absolute garbage and why should you avoid them whenever you can. If there is a rare chance that you need a key value store, there is a one key value store out of all the garbage that I actually like. And I don't think it's garbage. I think it's a unique product. I, I think it's engineering masterpiece, right? What uh, was implemented. So it's foundation DB. And what instantly set it, sets uh, this apart from most of the key value stores today, it has real transactions. And it doesn't have this like, oh, you know, some databases, you have transaction per key, like you can modify that key consistently. Nobody cares about transaction as a single key. When people talk about transactions, they care about transactions where you can modify as many records as you want, as many like key spaces as you want, and it's all consistent. That's what we talk about when we speak about transactions. So this database actually has that. And how this works, it's I'll uh, put a link in the description of a video that uh, explains by the, one of the founders how it works and it, it's quite fascinating, but I'll just make a simple, uh, very broad overview that doesn't delve into any complexity because there are like eight or seven components internally that you don't need to imagine. So what, what foundation DB does is say like, this is your client. And uh, so this is like foundation DB. Like say this is many instances, right? Of your foundation DB and they're all clustered, they're talking to each other. So basically, if you need a, a retransaction, every single transaction has its number, N, right? So whenever whenever you try to get a retransaction, you're getting N that is latest right to the cluster. So you will always get the latest read, latest, uh, uh, not stale reads, and you'll always get directly to the node for reads. What happens when you do want to perform a write transaction? So when a write transaction is from client side, all of your writes, like uh, you get read here, read it here, like say you do read, 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 and then write, write, write. And this entire transaction, when you call commit, is basically bundled together as a single unit. And then uh, you push it to foundation DB. And then there, you have a conflict resolution check. So say this is a timeline, right? And this is when your transaction started and when you commit. So 
There is conflict resolution check that checks that, you know, if you write this transaction, these keys, then no other transaction could have modified those keys. So they say this is overlapping transaction, you know, overlap one, and this is like first transaction T1. And uh, if these transactions can happen in parallel in condition where this transaction doesn't read and write any keys, that this transaction reads and writes. So if keys don't overlap, you can hammer database as hard as you want and these conflicts and if conflicts do happen, these are detected and then the client gets returned, okay, your transaction failed. What do you do then? You retry until you succeed. So this is very, very high level birds uh, overview of how this works. The high level idea, I'll put a link in the description that goes into more detail. But, you know, for me, as a typical user, when I care about high level stuff, can I do a transaction like in Postgres where I begin, do everything I want and commit? And yes, you can in this database here. You can modify any keys that you want. And you commit a transaction, either entire thing succeeds or if you have conflict, the entire thing fails. And that's it. Then you can, I reached that, uh, I did like when I was experimenting with this, I had three nodes and I did, uh, I think it was well over a million transactions per second when I benchmarked it. So, if you can, if you can, uh, if you like see like million transactions per second for your use case, well, good for you. But you know, it's uh, it's quite a, you know, it's I I think it's pretty scalable for people that complain about scale. <laughs> so yeah. So and another thing that sets us apart, you know, yeah. Well, this is theory. You can write this. Oh, you know, it detects conflicts, but does it really work though? Right? How can I trust it? Because there, every key value store garbage boasts in this documentation. Oh, like we're performant, we're consistent, like we're everything or whatever. Right? And you start testing it and it's trash. <laughs> or you like find a, a fear test and they all find all sorts of issues right there. And, and they get like PRs to them and hey, there's this issue here, this alternate bridge. Okay, okay, we'll fix this, we'll fix this. But they were pushing not working product and they just did it test. They just pushed out something and for monetary benefit, right? So how do we know that this actually works? So what Foundation DB does, uh, it's unique because I haven't heard about this. Of course, people test software in a lot of ways, but Foundation DB actually runs simulations, deterministic simulations. So they have like a one process, and then uh, they have all the different components in one process, right? So they simulate like network, everything, uh, this corruption, like network pauses, latencies, like lag or node is going down randomly. And they simulate like hundreds of thousands of these overnight and then it's just like you know every time there is an error this is checked and then you know if uh, some simulation is bad you can reproduce it the next day and check for bugs so that's how they search out issues and they run millions of these simulations right so it's actually tested like in production uh, well is it one-to-one -to, -one to production eh. I don't know, I didn't work with it directly, but I get a lot of confidence because nobody does this and their software is just full of bugs and I've never heard about foundation to be like yeah, having corrupted someone's data or something like that, you know, so that's the secret sauce why this makes this project successful and I also tried to break it down, I was killing processes, random, of course, this is not as simulation right but i really tried to corrupt it and i failed right so yeah so i think this is uh you know they take these guys that made this they really take their job seriously and you know i'm glad that there's at least one key value store that is that can boast itself as being rock solid right and uh also, this can replace an in-memory cache. There are like a lot of in-memory cache components. There's this one like one component, but it can be horizontally sharded. That's uh, very popular and 
you know, it has all sorts of consistency issues, right? And <laughs> I think it's trash and I don't understand why it got popular, right? Uh, like, guess in the comment what I might mean, <laughs> you know, but, you know, so you can have this as an in-memory cache. And what's different about this other in-memory cache is if you write to memory and you kill the process, you might lose some writes. But this has write ahead log, persistent write ahead log. And then you can just simply hammer all the in-memory keys and it's still, you will not lose writes if you receive that your commit succeeded. Right? It's persistent write ahead log and it just makes in memory, just as reliable as a simple database. It's just that you need memory, right? And uh, yeah, so, and another thing is, it's this is self-managing. And I think it's very important. Well, uh, initial setup was a little complex for me, but you know, once you get it there, then I tried hammering it really hard and I hammered this database hard as much as I could, right? And uh, it just recovers on its own. Right, uh, it's like smart. Uh, each of the component knows what it is, and then if some fails, then they get reelected. Everything gets like reinstated. It's, it's you can uh, kill pretty much everything, stop everything, start everything, and you just know that things will work. So, the internal architecture might be a little complex, a little involved, and you can watch in the video to see what I mean. There are a lot of boxes, right? But when I was running this. It's just like, you forget it, it exists. As far as you're concerned, you spin up a lot of processes and that's it, you forget about it. And you know, if something fails, like uh, some component fails, clients just retry and that's that's it. You, that's how you roll with foundation to be. So I think, it's, I think it's the best key value store out there, frankly, because I don't think this, this project like background, I remember I saw it, it's, like, I don't know, eight years ago when it was open source. And then it was a good project and it was purchased by Apple. Then it was closed source from for some time and then it was open sourced again. Yeah, so, you know, I think it's, and it hosts a lot of Apple's data. So I think it's very, it's unique product and it, what I saw so far, and another thing like uh, a fear, the a fear guy that tests all sort of database finds all sorts of issues and bugs. He had nothing bad to say about this database because he tweeted once, and I'll uh, attach the link in the description that I didn't test Foundation DB simply because the internal team that's developing this product actually do more rigorous testing than I can than I do, so I don't have anything to add. <laughs> so that is quite, quite a seal of approval, I think. Because, you know, if your guy, like, he broke down all sorts of things over the years, and he, so for him to say that this product, he, he didn't test it because it's well-tested enough, you know, that, that says a lot to me. So yeah, so that's my favorite key value store if I have, again, I don't use such things unless I have to. If Postgres instance suffices you, like highly available Postgres, then you can just use that and, you know, forget about it. It's simpler setup, right? This is more complex to run, but, you know, if I have to run this ever, you know, if I need such case that, yeah, we do need a key value store in this case, then I can rest assured that, you know, Foundation DB is available, it's rock solid and, uh, yeah, so my thought process is simple once again, and I, and I again, don't care about the new stuff that comes out, right? Yeah, so this has been David from Trivial Solutions.io. Now I'm signing out. Peace.